everybody. Uh, good evening and welcome to this uh, second uh, Hellion book launch, uh, virtual book launch. Um, as you may have gathered from the slightly hesitant start there, we're, um, we're learning on the job how to use the new updated version of Demio, which uh, may not look very different from the, uh, 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 the, the viewing end, but is, is quite radically different for those of us uh, behind the scenes. So I, I do apologise if things are slightly uh, hesitant tonight while we, uh, we get the hang of the new, uh, the new way of doing things. Um, as those of you who have done previous uh, online events, uh, will probably be aware the, uh, uh, the the software takes a little while for everybody to get into the room, which is why why we started uh, opening the doors ten minutes or so early. I'll, I'll just talk for a couple of minutes uh, to let people uh, join. We're still uh, ten or twelve short of the uh, the number who'd registered, so we may well have some latecomers joining in. Uh, you're probably all veterans and sick of this now, but for anybody who is uh, new to this uh, platform. Um, it's uh, it's entirely browser based, so if you have any trouble tonight uh, with, with audio or, or visual, other than that caused by our learning how to use the new version, for which again I apologise, um, you may find it helpful to switch to another browser if you have one installed. Uh, you can rejoin using the, the, the same link that you, you got in by. Uh, it seems to particularly like uh, Chrome, and it's uh, it can be a bit tricksy with Safari. So if you if you if you're on the latter and you have alternatives. That may be an option if you have any difficulty. Um, so switch browser if you have trouble, uh, come in and come out again if you have trouble. Um, ultimately, if, if, if your internet connection at your end lets you down, um, there will be a recording of the event sent out to uh, uh, to all, all who've registered. So you, you will at the very least get to, uh, to listen after the fact. Um, the format will be a, uh, a talk of about 25 minutes uh, and then a question and answer session. Um, if you want, to, if you can pose your questions in the uh, in the chat column where I can see a lot of you have already been uh, uh, introducing each other, uh, I, I can then flag them up as questions as we go along uh, and I can read them out at the end for our speaker to uh, respond to. Um, it, it's useful for me rather than having to wrangle lots of questions at the end. If something occurs to you, I pop the question in the chat. I can flag it up. If it's been answered by, by the time we get to the end of the talk, I just shan't ask it when we get to the, uh, the Q&A time. So that, don't worry about putting something in as, as we're going along. That, that would make it easier for me than, uh, than handling all the questions, reading them out and spotting them in the chat at the same time. Um, that's, I think, all I need to say uh, on a, a technical point of view. Uh, for those of you who may not have already uh, um, Purchased a copy of the uh, uh, the book that we're uh, we're, we're launching tonight with, with the uh, the introductory offer. Uh, there will be an offer for um, all attendees tonight, which uh, I shall po post the discount code in a moment. Excuse me, <coughs> I shall post the discount code in a moment in the uh, in the chat, uh, and that will be valid uh, for the rest of today and all of tomorrow uh, with fifteen percent off via the uh, Hellion website. So I'll pop that up in a moment. I, I will first of all, though, introduce our uh, our speaker for this evening, uh, Tom Scotland. Uh, Tom, if you'd care to uh, uh, join us up on the uh, on the stage. Um, Tom retired in two thousand and seven after a distinguished career in the health service. Uh, he's written a number of books on. Um, aspects of military medicine in the 19th century uh, and in the Great War. He has also uh, written uh, two battlefield guides to the, uh, the Western Front. Uh, but his topic tonight is uh, something going back a little earlier. Uh, as you all know, the, uh, the life of uh, James McGregor, um, who is going to talk about and explain the, uh, the personal connection to, that drew him to, uh, to write the autobiography. <laughs> write the biography, I think. Um, right. No, uh, you, you seem to be having the same difficulty I have, with, but you've come back with Andrew, that. Andrew, Andrew, I've switched my camera on. Yeah, and it's not turning on. No, what I'll I had to I'll do, what I had to do, Tom, was leave the stage and then come back on, and that brought me back on with everything. So I think that might be the uh, the approach to take. Okay.
you just bear with us a moment while we uh, get this sorted. Tom, I've just had a message through from the audience. That apparently, they, they, they can see you, even though you can't see you. I, I can't see myself, but they can see me. They can see you, apparently, yes. I've, I've oh, well. A message through. So if, if, if <laughs> yeah, the people are confirming there in, in the chat that you're, you're visible, so you can't see yourself, but the audience can see you. So, I, Well, I prefer not to see myself anyway. So. Well, we, 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 everything's fine in that case. I will, uh, in that case, put your slides up and uh, and disappear and uh, and let you get on with it. And my apologies again to the audience for the, uh, the confusion with this new... Uh, uh, there you go, Tom, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> I'd like to begin by saying thank you very much to, to Andrew Banford and, and also to Duncan Rogers of Helion and Co. Uh, for inviting me to speak to you this evening. Uh, as Andrew said, I'm a retired orthopaedic surgeon and spent most of my working life in Aberdeen, where I both trained as a surgeon and subsequently became a consultant with what was then the Grampian Health Board and an honorary senior lecturer with the University of Aberdeen. Now, for reasons which will soon become apparent, I have been acquainted with the life of Sir James McGregor for many, many years. Now, why write a book about Sir James McGregor now? Well, uh, that is because, that is because on the 9th of April 2021, that marked the 250th anniversary of James McGregor's birth. Now, in my book, I set out to show that McGregor had a life of great adventure. He served during the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. He treated wounded soldiers under heavy enemy fire and suffered from potentially deadly diseases which devastated armies at the time. He survived shipwrecks, he survived hazardous journeys across deserts, and he became Director General of Army Medical Services in 1815. At all times, he championed the cause of the common soldier and he transformed medical care in the army through his personal commitment and by revolutionizing the training of medical officers. Now, McGregor was born in the parish of Cromdale in the Highlands of Scotland on the 9th of April, 1771. James's father, Cahoon McGregor, farmed a small area of land around Cromdale. He also had a merchandise store and an inn but he barely scraped a living, and he, like many others, repaired roads to help provide for his growing family. Cahoon McGregor was an ambitious man, and he left Cromdale for Aberdeen when James was four years old. He established a business in the Gallagate region of Aberdeen, specialising in hosiery. When James was nine years old, his father sent him to the Aberdeen Grammar School, where he remained for five years. And the last day at school was a memorable one for young James, because in his autobiography, published posthumously, he wrote, I ran to my father's house at a quicker pace than I ever ran in the course of my life to announce my success in having obtained the highest prize in the fifth or high class my heart did not swell with more pride when, nearly half a century afterwards, I was elected Lord Rector of my alma mater. McGregor spent four years at Marshall College studying the classics, and he graduated, he said, after an examination not the most severe or searching. McGregor needed much more of a challenge, and he decided to study medicine and was apprenticed to a Dr. French in Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. During his training, he spent a year in Edinburgh studying under Alexander Munro Secundus, who was an inspirational teacher, anatomist and physician, who made a, played a major role 
in making Edinburgh Medical School a world famous institute. McGreer was elected a member of the Edinburgh Medical and Chirurgical Society when he was there, and upon his return to Aberdeen on the 14th of December 1789, McGregor and 11 of his student colleagues founded the Aberdeen Medical Society. Initially, it was founded as a self-help group because teaching was not very good in Aberdeen at the time. McGregor left for London in 1793, where he joined the army after revolutionary France declared war on Britain. But he never forgot his roots, and he supported the Aberdeen Medical Society throughout his long life. From the earliest period of the institution of the Medical Society of Aberdeen, in whatever quarter of the globe I was stationed, I never ceased to entertain the warmest interest in its prosperity. It was renamed the Aberdeen Medical Chirurgical Society in 1811, and I became a member of the society nearly 40 years ago, and had ample opportunity to study the portrait of MacGregor by Andrew Geddes, which stood behind the lectern in the Medical Chirurgical Hall. MacGregor purchased a commission as a regimental surgeon with the 88th Regiment of Foot, the Connaught Rangers. Now, not all regimental surgeons were medically qualified at the time, far from it indeed. Many came from very humble backgrounds and regimental surgeons were generally despised by service officers. But MacGregor was undeterred. He loved the army and he set himself very high standards. He always put the need of the common soldier first, and in so doing, gained the respect of his commanding officers and the love of the men for whom he cared. At the same time, he had a very scientific orientation and he kept accurate statistical records to improve his understanding of the diseases which prevailed at the time. The 80th Regiment of Foot was initially stationed in Jersey, where MacGregor caught typhus fever and very nearly died. It's very important to point out that nearly four times as many soldiers died from disease as succumbed to wounds at the time. Typhus fever is transmitted by the feces of the body louse. The causative organism wasn't identified until 1916 by Ulrike de Rocha Lima and Stanislaus von Prausek working in a prison hospital in Hamburg. The organism was named Rakezi Prausekii after von Prausek died of typhus fever. None of this, of course, was known in MacGregor's time. Fevers were thought to be caused by extremes of temperature, by extremes of humidity, by soil conditions, and by miasmata, the vapours arising from boggy, marshy ground. It would be a hundred years and more before the viruses, the bacteria, and the parasites responsible for diseases began to be discovered. Now, in successive chapters of the book, I'll take the reader through the challenging years of MacGregor's life as a regimental surgeon. He was with the regiment in Flanders between 1794 and 1795, where, alas, he caught typhus fever again, and once again he nearly died, but of course recovered. In one incident in Nijmegen, the British were besieged by the French and MacGregor had to use a church as a makeshift regimental hospital, while a French cannonade from around the walls of the city pounded the besieged defenders. MacGregor had to move the wounded to another part of the church. Then 1795 to 1796, he was in the West Indies, where mosquito-borne diseases of yellow fever and malaria were present. MacGregor caught dysentery, but fortunately avoided yellow fever. 
between 1793 and 1815, there were an estimated 70,000 deaths of British military personnel in the West Indies. 90% of these deaths were caused by disease, mostly yellow fever. While in Grenada in the West Indies, he treated wounded in an attack when a gun killed two of the wounded he was treating and his face was covered with the blood and brains of one of the men he was trying to save. He really was in the very firing line and showed great stamina and great determination. Between 1798 and 1804, the regiment was in India. And during that time, there was an expedition to Egypt. This was a coalition force of regiments of the British Army and regiments of the Honourable East India Company. And MacGregor was in charge of the medical services, where he had to deal with an outbreak of bubonic plague. During the time in the Egyptian campaign, MacGregor worked very closely with General Sir David Baird. Close cooperation with his commanding officer enabled MacGregor to provide the best possible medical care for the men he was looking after. He knew full well that prevention of disease was better than cure. He wrote, a good commanding officer has in general a healthy regiment. Everything can be done in the prevention of disease, but unfortunately very little in the treatment when it supervenes. MacGregor's outstanding public health and administrative skills were recognised when he was appointed Deputy Inspector of Hospitals for the North District, based around Hull, in 1805. He was in his element. My appointment was one which was particularly congenial to my mind and habits. From my first entrance into the service, I had some turn for statistical statements, for collecting medical facts and generalising upon them. And I made for my own satisfaction monthly, quarterly and annual statements of the diseases which had come under my notice. He had an opportunity to educate his subordinates and he wrote, no man leaving the university or school of medicine in which he's brought up can conceive that he has finished his studies upon leaving it. He taught inexperienced clinicians how to perform a physical examination and to keep accurate records. He provided feedback, sending written reports to commanding officers and making positive suggestions. His aim was to be constructive and to be encouraging. This is what is known in the 21st century as continuing medical education. MacGregor became Deputy Inspector of Hospitals for the South West District in 1806. This was a much busier job. It was the most demanding job in the country, but as usual, MacGregor embraced it with great enthusiasm. My charge was now the greatest in the country, for besides the great number of troops, I had the harassing duties of embarkations and disembarkations at Portsmouth, and furthermore the large general hospital at the Isle of Wight. It got very much busier in January 1809, because 27,000 British soldiers from the late Sir John Moore's army were evacuated from Corona in January 1809. They reached Portsmouth in a terrible state. There was a complete breakdown of health and typhus fever and dysentery ran rampant through the troops. MacGregor had to deal with 6,000 sick and wounded and many had to be billeted in prison hulks because the hospitals were all Fool. The reader is then transported to the Iberian Peninsula where Sir Arthur Wellesley landed in Lisbon in April 1809. He commanded an Anglo-Portuguese army. His Spanish allies were better suited to guerrilla tactics. Wellesley was made Viscount Wellington 
of Talavera after a battle of that name in July 1809. He was generally very successful against the French, but as the months went by, Wellington became increasingly concerned by large numbers of sick in his army. But why did the British have such a high sickness rate? Well, many were suffering from chronic ill health from the very outset, and this predisposed the disease. Many were veterans of a previous campaign, because in July 1809, 40,000 soldiers embarked from British shores for the island of Walcheren, now part of the reclaimed landmass of the Netherlands. The aim was to take the important port of Antwerp from the French and relieve pressure on the Austrian allies of the Fifth Coalition. The Austrians were fighting Napoleon on the Danube. Between July and December 1809, thousands of men died or became chronically sick from what became known as Walcheren fever. This was probably a lethal cocktail of typhus, typhoid, malaria and dysentery. Another important factor was that many soldiers in the peninsula were raw recruits. <clears throat> they were often in poor health from the outset and they were not acclimatized to conditions of warfare. Things were so bad that on the 3rd of October 1811, Wellington sent a dispatch requesting that the best medical officer available be sent out to the peninsula. The Duke of York had no hesitation in sending out James McGregor. McGregor reached Lisbon in January 1812. He noted straight away that there were far too medical officers in Lisbon enjoying life with their wives and girlfriends and he sent them to where they were of much more use to Wellington. He reorganized the apothecary and the purveyor departments which were inefficient. And then he set off to join Wellington who was about to lay besiege to the border fortress of Badajoz. But he didn't go directly. He went by Welling at Wellington's instructions via the general hospitals in Portugal. At Coimbra, he segregated the sick from the wounded and established convalescent hospitals. Far too many men were discharged from hospital too soon, not fully recovered, back to cold, miserable barracks, and they died of relapses of the disease. Convalescent hospitals helped to minimise these losses. At Solarico, he improved the cleanliness and ventilation of hospitals a measure which he then subsequently introduced to all the general hospitals in Portugal. He reached Wellington convinced that it was far better to expand the regimental system of hospitals close to the front and as few cases as possible should be sent to the general hospitals in Portugal and to Lisbon. Those with minor conditions could be returned to duty more quickly and the seriously sick and wounded would not have to endure dreadful transport provided by unsprung bullock carts. McGregor knew full well that the French had a far better system. They had sprung wagons of Dominic Larry's Ambulance Volant or Flying Ambulance. A flying ambulance consisted of three divisions, each with 113 men. Each division had 12 light and four heavy sprung wagons. McGregor had first met Larry in Egypt in 1801 following the French surrender of Alexandria. At the time, Larry was surgeon in chief to Napoleon's Army of the Orient. The two men would keep in touch thereafter. Indeed, they would become good friends. And in 1817, Baron Dominic Larry was made an honorary member of the Aberdeen Medical Chirurgical Society at James McGregor's instigation. Now Wellington approved of most of McGregor's proposals, but he would not sanction the use of good transport for sick and wounded soldiers 
to regimental hospitals. After the Battle of Salamanca, on the 22nd of July 1812, Wellington was sitting for a portrait by Goya in Madrid when his chief medical officer entered the room. MacGregor reported that he had used good transport wagons to evacuate wounded after the battle. Wellington flew into a rage and Goya ran from the room. I shall be glad to know who is to command this army, I or you. I establish one route, one line of communication, you establish another. And order the commissariat and the supplies by that line as long as you live, sir. Never do so again. Never do anything without my orders. But MacGregor stood his ground. There was no time to consult your lordship without loss of life. Wellington's anger soon subsided because MacGregor had Wellington's complete confidence. The siege of Burgos, September, October 1812, things were not going well for Wellington. He was short of engineers and siege artillery. And MacGregor was present when Wellington decided that he must retreat to Portugal. I must leave this place this very night, he said. But what is to become of our sick and wounded? He asked MacGregor. I was happy to inform him that I got all the carts and mules that came up with provision for the army, and by them on their return had daily sent back every one that could be moved to the hospitals which I had established. Wellington quickly rejoined, Admirable, I shall be off tonight. Make your own arrangements quickly and quietly. And so began the terrible retreat from Burgos into Portugal, a long and difficult withdrawal. The army was sick and demoralised. There was an inevitable outbreak of typhus fever, and Wellington despaired of ever being able to engage the French in a meaningful fashion again. But MacGregor transformed the health of the army over the winter of 1812-13. to 13. This graph shows hospital admissions expressed as a percentage of regimental strength between January 1812 and June 1813. And you will see that around the time of the siege of Burgos, 35 to 37 percent of the regimental strength was sick in hospital. After the return to Portugal and over the winter months during convalescence, that percentage gradually and steadily declined until, by June of 1813, 16.2 percent were in hospital, a marked improvement. But how did MacGregor achieve this? Most importantly, he persuaded Wellington to make full use of the regimental hospitals, and he increased their total capacity from 2,000 to 5,000. As a result, fewer seriously sick were evacuated on unsprung bullet carts. In a short time, he said, the march of the sick to the established hospitals in the rear was stopped, and it was high time, for the number that died in the way of those sent to the rear was great. Early treatment, with supportive measures in regimental hospitals, improved the prognosis of those who were seriously sick, and less severely individuals were able to return to duty more quickly. And it's been estimated that McGregor made 4,000 to 5,000 soldiers available for fighting, and fight they did. At the Battle of Victoria on the 21st of June 1813, an overwhelming victory for Wellington. British casualties were 501 killed, 2,807 wounded. The surgeons, most notably George James Guthrie, had to deal with British, Spanish and Portuguese casualties as well as captured French casualties. Guthrie was a surgeon of exceptional ability, and it was MacGregor's responsibility to ensure that Guthrie and his colleagues had adequate facilities provided to treat the wounded. MacGregor was also responsible for ensuring that all surgeons were sufficiently skilled in their practice to deal with the wounded. Every soldier had the right to receive the best possible treatment, and McGregor was a fierce critic of any surgeon who did less than his best. 
It was said with much truth by an eminent individual, wrote McGregor in his autobiography, that he thought the extraordinary exertions of the medical officers of the army might be said to have decided the day at Vittoria, for their exertions had undoubtedly added a full division and strength to Lord Wellington's army. And without these 4,000 or 5,000 men, it is more than doubtful if his lordship with all his unrivaled talents could have carried the day. James McGregor became Director General of Army Medical Services on the 13th of June 1815, just a few days before the Battle of Waterloo. He remained in post until 1850. His overriding priority throughout his life was to provide good medical care for the common soldier. The soldier should not be consigned to the ignorant and uneducated of the profession. He is clearly entitled to the same quality of medical advice as when he was a citizen and is not to be put off with a cheap article of a doctor. He improved the education of army medical officers and towards the end of his career he was able to look back and say this. Whatever may formerly have been the condition of those who entered the medical department of the army, it is now and has been far otherwise for the last 30 or 40 years at least. James McGregor died on the 2nd of April 1858. After his death, a commemorative obelisk was erected in the quadrangle of Marshall College McGregor, you see, had been elected Lord Rector of Marshall College on three occasions in 1826, 1827 and 1841. The obelisk was removed to Duthy Park in Aberdeen, overlooking the River Dee in 1905, when Marshall College underwent a major redevelopment. In my retirement, I frequently cycle along the old Deeside railway line, now a walking and cycle track to Duthie Park, where I sit and enjoy a coffee at the base of the memorial and reflect upon the life of a most remarkable lamb, man, whose life truly was one of great adventure. And the last paragraph on the memorial tablet reads, in the course of 57 years of active service, he was exposed to the vicissitudes of war and climate Besides encountering shipwreck and other dangers at sea, yet he lived to attain a tranquil and happy old age. He died in London on the 2nd of April 1858. This memorial is erected near the place of his education and the scenes of his youth. Thank you. That's it. Thank you, Tom. That was uh, that was an excellent look through of, uh, of McGregor's life. Um, we've got a couple of questions already posed, and I can see more appearing. Um, I'm going to bring them up on the uh, uh, on the screen, um, but I'll also read them out for the benefit of anybody who's uh, watching after the fact on the uh, uh, on, on the recording, because that that doesn't uh, show the chat function. So. Um, First of all, then, a question from Rob for you. Um, it says, to, uh, to what extent did the treatments for disease available to regimental surgeons at the time cause more harm than good? Uh, uh, some treatments were quite good. Some treatments did no harm, but no good. And other treatments were positively harmful. For example, um, mercury. Mercury was used to induce salivation. It was believed that if people had infections, you made people sweat, you made people salivate, you gave them diarrhea, you did everything to evacuate them. And mercury causes toxicity and salivation is one of the toxic effects of mercury. So if the disease did not kill the patient, the mercury probably would. Bleeding was another thing that was used for all conditions, both medical and surgical, and it almost invariably did harm. On the other hand, plant-based medicines were good, and most physicians at the time were botanists, and plant-based medicines such as digitalis from the Fripoxglav 
are still used to this day. Quinine was used for the treatment of intermittent fever. So that was good. So good, bad, and indifferent is really the answer. Uh, thank you. Um, another one from... Uh from Ian, uh, who asks, uh, was the person who took over from McGregor when he was sent to Portugal up to the task? Um, now, I, I don't know who became deputy director, deputy inspector of hospitals in, in um, South West District, but when McGregor retired, Andrew Smith became director general and it's arguable whether he was up to the task. And I'm not sure if that's what the questioner is meaning. Uh, no, I was a little, I was, uh, Ian, if you want to expand on that, if, 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 we've not, if, if Tom's not answered you uh, fully there, but by all means, uh, pose a supplementary question and, uh, and we'll see if we can, we can come back to, uh, to that one. Uh, I'll, I mean, move to... Sorry, I'll just say McGregor's successor, Andrew Smith, who, who was also a Scot, had really terrible trouble with uh, various people for reasons which I can explain if that's required. Okay, well, we can come back to that if uh, it needs to be. Uh, I'll move on to the next one for now. Um, uh, from David, who asks, uh, what was the ratio of surgeons to soldiers when on campaign? Um, I can't answer that question. I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry. No, that's for entirely fair enough. I, was gonna say, I, I ought to be able to because I've done a lot of work on regimental returns and I, I, I couldn't off the top of my head either. Um, I mean, I'm trying to think you got... I, I, I'd, I'd have to... Sorry, go on. No, I was saying it's, in, it's in, the, in my book. I've got the number of surgeons and I've got the size of the army, but I can't remember it. I can't work it out. Right, buy, the book, buy the book and do the maths, people. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that, there's your answer. Um, uh, from Ian again, then. Um, would you say that overall McGregor was a better surgeon or a better administrator? Uh, McGregor was an administrator. I, I don't think, well, he he's, did his time as a regimental surgeon. I don't know if he was good, bad or indifferent, but where McGregor excelled was in administration and organisation because prevention of disease was the most pressing necessity. Four times as many soldiers died of disease and the treatments of disease were very, very poor. So prevention of disease was of paramount importance. So McGregor's great strength was as an administrator, not as a surgeon. And he had an excellent surgeon in the peninsula, of course, in the form of George James Guthrie, who was the outstanding surgeon of his era. Uh, right, well, uh, two questions from uh, from Chris. I, I'll, I'll put the second one up there. I, I think they're, uh, they're, they're linked to some extent. Um, he asks, uh, what was the most gruesome or controversial treatment at the time compared to today's standards? Uh, and then following on with, with one uh, a example of, of such a treatment, uh, he asks, uh, how did doctors think that uh, the bleeding helped? Uh, uh, right. Um, the most gruesome controversial treatment. Um, many treatments were gruesome. But the treatment for fevers, mercury, immersion in cold water, purgatives, all were given to try and treat disease, to try and get rid of inflammation by getting rid of fluids from the body by whatever mechanism. And these, I, I would have thought that bleeding probably, bleeding was probably the worst because bleeding killed patients. There's no doubt about it. If you had a, a soldier who had a, a wound of his leg and you bled him a couple of units of blood, then the next day you bled him again and the next day you bled him again, then the bleeding would precipitate his demise without any question. And why did you think bleeding helped? Getting rid of bad blood. There was no scientific basis to it. It was anecdotal. It was almost like witchcraft, but bleeding with bad blood. And you could use venous section. And if you didn't want to take too much blood out, you could shave their heads and put leeches on their heads to extract blood more slowly. 
which wasn't so harmful as an acute, massive blood loss. But I don't know why they thought it helped, other than to say that it well, got rid of bad blood. How's that for science? Yeah, it makes you glad for the uh, the advances, doesn't it? Um, another one then from uh, David, who asks, uh, how did the training of French surgeons compare with the training of British surgeons, uh, given that their transportation system was initially more advanced? Yes. Well, I, I think probably they were they were about the same. There were, there, were, there were two excellent surgeons at the time. One was Dominic Larry, and the other was George Guthrie. And they were both very, very good at what they did. And they both respected each other's work and they communicated despite the fact that they were enemies. What the French had that was far, far better was an ambulance system, which really, I suppose, was the basis of the field ambulance in the First World War. And the British never had that. And there was a great deal of criticism about that uh, in the in the Peninsula War, it was no better in the Crimean War, and it was only after the Crimea that an evacuation pathway, something along the lines of Larry's Ambulance for Long was, was devised. So the French were always ahead with their transport, but I think pretty equal as far as their surgery was concerned. They were, both Larry and, and Guthrie were very, very pioneering surgeons, both years ahead of their time. Thank you. Uh, another one then from Chris, who asks, uh, was a soldier seen as an asset worth investing time and resources into if they were unwell and could not fulfil their duty anymore? Uh, yes. I, I, I think Wellington particularly, you know, had a great regard for, for his soldiers and the wounded and the sick were treated well. I don't think they were regarded as an expendable resource. I, I think there was more to it than that. And McGregor had a great deal of, of empathy with the common soldier and would never regard them as anything but you know, a human being of deserving of every effort made for his well-being. Yeah, I mean, I'd back that up thinking from a slightly more pragmatic point of view from my, my own work. We, the British Army didn't have enough men to... Uh... <laughs> uh, to, to, to take that sort of cavalier approach, you know, uh, a, a soldier was uh, was certainly not, and an experienced soldier who was who was used to serving in the peninsula in particular uh, was a valuable asset and uh, and something to be cherished. So yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd certainly back you up entirely on that one. Just from from my own work, I'm sure others in the audience who, who've worked on uh, 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 regiments out there would uh, would, would agree. I think we, yeah, we've got one more. Uh, oh, it's Chris, Chris again. Um, he says this time, um, how successful was surgery on the battlefield at the time? They're talking about field surgery. Yeah, um, it was very good. <clears throat> um, and it's down to Guthrie. I'm talking about British surgery. Guthrie discovered that early surgery, now, I'm talking about amputation here because a lot of the surgery was amputation surgery. So I'm, I'm going to confine my, my answer to talking about amputations. Guthrie discovered that early amputation was associated with a mortality of something less than 20%. If there was a delay in surgery to the point where the wound became inflamed and red and injurated, the mortality was very much higher, something in the order of 68%. So Guthrie really did a first controlled trial of early versus late surgery, and early surgery won hands down. Now, you can fast forward a hundred years to the Great War, and what did they do in the Great War? But they transferred soldiers with horrible wounds to distant base hospitals. And they arrived with horribly infected wounds with a very, very high mortality from septic infections and from gangrene. So the lessons that Guthrie uh, taught a hundred years before were either ignored or not known about in the British evacuation pathway in 1914. It changed dramatically as the months went by, but Guthrie 
was the instigator of early surgery on the battlefield, as indeed was Larry. They, they developed along parallel lines. Thank you. I've got another one following on from that, actually, quite neatly, uh, from uh, Ian. He asks, uh, thinking about those who might assist the field surgeon during a battle, would these be musicians, likely wounded, old soldiers no longer fit to fight? Would it be seen as a good number? Um, well, first of all, evacuation of the wounded. To the, to the field hospital, there were no orderlies to take the wounded from the field. And so you very often got droves of men taking a soldier with an amputated finger up to the field ambulance, field hospital, just to get away for a, for a while. Um, musicians, no, not really. It was just the, the, the comrades would take them back just to get out, just to get out. Old soldiers no longer fit to fight. Yes, they were employed, I think. Uh, Mick Crumplin, I'm sure, would probably keep me right in this. I don't know if he's there, but he would. But they, they employed old soldiers after, during Waterloo uh, to help with, with wounded. Um, more than that, don't think I can say any more than that. No, fair enough. That's uh, I, I, I think that, that's answered that satisfactorily. I believe, unless anybody wants to jump in at the final minute, that was the last question. Um, I'm just going to pop, pop the uh, book code up again and uh, give people a chance in case there's anything else that comes to mind. But no, I think I think Tom, you've you 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 satisfied, you satisfied your audience. It, it, it was certainly an excellent talk. And I, oh, well, we we got one more. No, that's people saying what a great talk it was. So no, I think we can uh, we can call, we can call it a night based on that. Thank you very much. Um, well, thank you for inviting me. No, and and thank you everybody for coming along. I can't see you. I can't even see myself, which is a good thing. No, they're, they're, they're definitely there. I, I can see nice things appearing in the chat. So uh, that's uh, that's been wonderful. If you haven't already bought the book uh, and you want to, you and, and why wouldn't you after the uh, the, the wonderful uh, sales pitch you've just heard? Uh, the the offer code is uh, is in the chat. Uh, I'll close things down in a moment. Uh, I'll, I'll leave the chat up for a little while longer, just as people are filtering out uh, and give people a chance to uh, to note down the code. Um, th these two launches for for the Reason Revolution series were a, a, a little bit of a pilot, but uh, based on the one we did last week, uh, and, and, and on uh, I think it's been reinforced by, by tonight. So we, we're going to try and do some more. Uh, while, while things are getting back to normal um, before we can do actual uh, events again. Uh, and probably, to be honest, we'll keep doing them because, for example, with authors who are overseas, uh, it, it's something that we, we, we can do as an extra to, to the physical launches. So uh, watch this space for some more. Uh, and hopefully we'll expand it to uh, some of the other titles in the Hellion range, as well as just the uh, recent Revolution series. But thank you all for uh, listening. Thank you again to, to Tom for his talk. I'm going to close it down now. So I'll, I'll leave the chat for a couple of minutes. Uh, but again, uh, thank you and good night. <laughs>